Thanks. Okay, hi everyone. Um, so yeah, I am here to talk about um, rape, uh, murder, prostitution, and um, apps. So um, I appreciate, you know, that is pretty riveting after lunch stuff. So uh, thank you very much for, for sticking with me. So my name's Matt Howarth. I founded a social enterprise called Reason Digital. And what we do is we try and find ways to make technology uh, work to solve social problems. And the reason I set Reason Digital up uh, about eight years ago now was I just had this kind of niggling feeling that all of these promises around how technology was going to revolutionize the world and help people, um, they were kind of coming true, but they were coming true in like increasingly trivial ways. And I think you, know, you can kind of see that today, where like, your mobile phone is this amazing device that connects you to all these people. Uh, but what do you use it for? Right? You use it for like, getting a taxi a little bit easier, or you know, finding a takeaway, or booking a cheaper train ticket. Uh, and there's some great work that loads of people are doing to try and find ways to, to, to make that mobile phone and your computer do things that actually positively impact kind of bigger issues. Uh, and, and that's the kind of space that I'm interested in. So, a while ago, I was thinking about this, um, and I ended up um, working with uh, an amazing charity up in Manchester called Manchester Action on Street Health, or MASH. Um, and what they do is, when presumably most of us are all asleep, they are driving around the streets of Manchester in a little van, uh, making cups of tea for street sex workers and checking that they're okay. And you're working with those kind of people is, you know, kind of rekindles your faith in humanity, the fact that, you know, they're going out there doing that around an issue that so few people uh, care about or even think about. So um, I was working with them, and I was in their, um, in their office, uh, and they had this massive notice board on the wall with all these different colored bits of paper all laminated, and at the top it said, Dodgy Punter's Board. So I started reading it, I was waiting for someone, and um, there were all these descriptions of these kind of horrible things that were happening to sex workers out on the streets. Uh, some of them were really kind of just annoying. So like there was one that was about um, somebody, some like teenager driving around in a Vauxhall Nova, I think it was, throwing hard boiled eggs at street sex workers. So that's kind of the low end of the scale. What really annoyed me about that was the fact that he'd gone to the trouble to boil them. I mean, it <laughs> suggests a, a real level of premeditation that I think is slightly sociopathic. All, all, all the way to the top end, which, you know, obviously, um, you know, some of you might remember the story around Steve Wright, the, the, um, you, you know, who, uh, who was a serial killer that strangled to death around five sex workers in Ipswich in 2006, I think it was. Um, and these, you know, for sex workers who were already in quite a difficult position, many of them, uh, the, the, these are the kind of day-to-day -day hazards of, 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 of the job. You know, if you are working as a sex worker, um, your chances at some point in your career of being um, seriously assaulted or raped is 50-50, one in two. That's insane. I, I, and, you know, if you just reflect for a second about where you would go if you were seriously uh, under threat from rape or serious assault at work, I imagine many of us would think to phone the police, right? But obviously, working as a sex worker, your relationship to the police is quite a difficult one. Uh, and often, sex workers kind of mistrust the authority of the police and other authorities and bodies. So what was fantastic about this notice board uh, was that it was a way for sex workers to collaborate with each other, to share information, to keep themselves safe without relying on uh, an external, you know, higher level authority that they mistrusted. Um, but there was a bit of a problem with this. Um, one of the organizations that distributes these, um, these, these alerts uh, down here in London is called Swish. And they put together this kind of zine, um, which you know, is kind of a booklet full of these alerts. Uh, and interestingly, like one copy I was reading, at the back you had all these like, horrible descriptions of kind of rape and assaults. And then at the back they had a recipe for a casserole with herby dumplings. Um, <laughs> But you know, I thought this is this is great. You know, this this, this kind of decentralised information network, getting this information out there, and also you know, like treating these people with some respect, saying you know, well, you know, we've all got to eat, right? Um, you know, it's about positivity as well as these these negative things. Uh, but 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 the issue is that if you imagine something happening out on the street, um, and the time that it takes to get that reported, kind of written up, distributed emailed around the country, printed out, in the case of MASH, printed onto colored paper, laminated, uh, pinned up on a notice board, 
and then the amount of time it takes for a sex worker maybe to drop into MASH's center for a free sexual health checkup or an art therapy session. You know, we could be talking about a period of weeks or even months between something happening and a sex worker knowing about it, which in some cases is, is, is super helpful and, and that has you know, prevented uh, serious crimes from happening. It's put some pretty nasty people behind bars. And remember, the people that attack sex workers don't just attack sex workers. They are generally nasty people that would attack you as well. So, you know, it pays for us all this stuff. So, um, so yeah, what, 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 what I was interested in was how could we use technology and make technology work here? Now, you know, I'm one of these kind of um, people that, uh, that, that's kind of involved in technology and startups and stuff like that, that you're all probably bored of reading about in The Guardian, I imagine, about Tech City and all this stuff, right? But the problem that I face is that every time you want to do something with technology, these words keep emerging, right? Viability is one word. You know, how can we make this viable? How is this going to make money? Scale, how is this thing going to reach millions of people? Because, you know, the kind of interactions people have with technology tend to generate pennies at a time. And, you know, unless it's scaled to millions, how is that going to, going to work as a business? Well, obviously, you know, helping sex workers be safe with technology is not a very good business. <laughs> it doesn't scale very big. Um, it's difficult to make money from. So uh, we started uh, spending some of our time kind of prototyping a solution to this. Uh, and we were eventually fortunate enough to secure some funding uh, with the Nominet Trust that funded the rest of the development. And this process that we did was, uh, was really um, very much in consultation with the sex workers. And I think that's a key thing about making technology work for vulnerable groups is that you've got to talk to these people. You've got to talk to users and find a way to make it useful for them. So we, when we got funding from Nominet Trust, we started working with the organization that stewards these alerts, who are called Ugly Mugs. Um, and basically, uh, we thought, OK, we put in our funding bid. Like, What we'll do is we'll invite all the sex workers around for a cup of tea and some biscuits. And they'll all sit around, and we'll all chat about stuff. And we'll learn about them, and we'll make our mobile app better. Right? Um, the issue was that that like, doesn't really work for a group like that. Um, so what we ended up doing is we ended up taking this app and going out into brothels under canal bridges. Uh, we went to see escorts and showed it them in the environments that they operate in. So, um, so yeah, there's several surreal kind of memories I have of standing underneath canal bridges in Manchester, talking to male sex workers, holding my mobile phone, going, "Would you use this? How would this? How could we make this better?" Right? Which incidentally is a really crap excuse if you're ever stopped by the police in a red light district. <laughs> <laughs> I've tried it, and uh, yeah, it took some, took some getting out of that. But, um, but yeah, so what, the, what the, the mobile app ended up doing was basically really simple. Instead of a sex worker reporting something to, you know, a, uh, to a support organization and taking kind of weeks or months of this information to get out there, we've made a, a free mobile phone app uh, called Safety Nets. And what it does is uh, a sex worker, if they see something suspicious or they get attacked or, or mugged or whatever, they can type a text message length alert into this app. And then everybody else that uses the app uh, nearby instantly gets a little ping on their phone and they can see what's going on. So we're shortening that gap, that information gap from you know, potentially weeks or months to minutes or seconds. And we think that will really help to, to save lives and, and, and help to you know, prevent some pretty horrible things from happening. Uh, the app, incidentally, if any of you are searching in the App Store, is not one that you can use for obvious reasons. It's something that we have to keep protected. So this app is, uh, is in pilot now, and we hope it'll eventually reach uh, you know, a decent percentage of the 80,000 people that are working as a sex worker in the UK. So, um, so yeah, that is my little story of how we, um, how we you know, work with a vulnerable group to, to use technology, to try and bring technology to bear on some of these kind of bigger issues. And, and some of these issues that affect maybe a tiny minority of people, but the, uh, the effect that that has on that tiny minority of people is you know, maybe a little bit more than the frustration of hailing a cab or finding the best place to get a takeaway. Um, so yeah, does anyone have any questions for me? Yes, do you want to start here? <laughs> in the women's sector. Um, mm -hmm. What do you do to sort of promote this app? And is it completely user um, sort of, you, is it just user voices or do you have any other information that you give to sex workers like services, anything in sort of exiting prostitution, that sort of thing mm -hmm. to, you know, help them in other ways apart from just safety? Mm -hmm. there's, there's no overt information in the app about exiting prostitution and that's something that we didn't take a stand on in terms of, uh, in terms of the app, uh, in, in terms of uh, 
building trust with that group and being quite neutral around that issue. Uh, but th there are signposts to other kind of sources of information in the app. Uh, and one of the things that was quite interesting when we did the consultation, we were talking to, to sex workers, was that, um, and we talked you know, across the whole spectrum from um, street sex workers in, in Manchester. One of the escorts we talked to lives in Knightsbridge. Um, so you know the whole kind of spectrum. And, and one thing uh, that came up was that, that somebody, one of the male sex workers in a, in a drop-in in Manchester said, um, do all the alerts have to be negative? Can't we get some like good news popping up on our phone instead of, you know, hey, there's been another attack, hey, there's been another theft. Um, so as a result of that, that prompted us to think, let's signpost some, some support resources in there. So, so that is something that the app does as well. And how do you promote the app um, to different services? Well, the app at the moment is currently in a pilot stage, so um, it's gone out on the streets of Manchester. We've got uh, groups of volunteers that are going around uh, and, and, and showing um, sex workers how to use it in the three kind of strata of sex work, which is street sex work, um, saunas and brothels and uh, escorts. So we've trained volunteers that reach those groups anyway through their kind of outreach work to go show them how to install it. We actually undertook the first piece of research into the smartphone usage of sex workers, um, and we found that whilst um, street sex workers in particular had a, uh, a lower proportion of smartphone use than the average UK citizen. Uh, we, uh, we found that escorts had about the same or higher on average smartphone use. Uh, and if you go into uh, a brothel and talk to people about what they're doing on their smartphones, as you do, uh, you will find that, you know, uh, that, that, that working in a brothel is quite a boring job at times and people are sat there playing Candy Crush and texting friends and um, yeah, so we were able to kind of reach them through the outreach workers to try and show them how to use this other app on their existing device. Any other questions? I think you've was, kind yes. of answered my question. But I think what you've done is incredible, by the way. It's yes. incredible. Um, but you've kind of answered my question partly, which was this technology. I mean, you know, I, I don't work at the moment, and I'm crippled by my iPhone rental thing. You know, <laughs> um, these phones they're not available to everyone and particularly if you're if you are a street sex worker you are on drugs you don't have that kind of thing it's again you're creating you know it, it, the usability isn't out there if you it, do you know what i mean there's yeah, something I, about I, it that isn't isn't available to all oh, you're missing the people that most need this who are on the street rather than the ones who are protected in brothels yeah, I think that's a really, uh, a really important point. So around about 50% of street sex workers have access to a smartphone device. Um, our, our view of that is that effectively um, we're, we're taking something that kind of works really well already, which is this kind of zine, you know, notice board system. And we're trying to kind of, um, you know, boost that basically, make it more effective for the people that can access that. We're really keen to make sure that, that, that everybody can access this that needs it. One thing that we do know is that, you know, it was inconceivable like 10 years ago that ev every single person in the UK would have, a, have a, a mobile phone, and now they do. And we're seeing a similar sort of trend with smartphones, and there's a few of people out there, maybe some of you in this room, that are very proudly clinging onto their Nokia brick phone that you know lasts for four weeks and you can throw it against the wall and it still works, right? Uh, one day, unfortunately, that phone will break and you will walk into Carphone Warehouse and ask for a phone and the only option will be a smartphone. So I, I think you're absolutely right. You've got to be uh, careful of that. But I think we're really thinking about you know, these things take ages, these pilots take ages, these funding bids take ages, and, and what we're hopeful of is in the two to three years down the line that there may be kind of more proliferation.